thank you for this kind introduction and uh, I would say that I'm very uh, uh, pleased and uh, honored to be here back here because as uh, you know I was uh, for many years I think uh, teaching a course here that was Europe in a global economy I have to uh, uh, just give up because I was uh, five years in a Senate of Italian Republic was uh, a very interesting, uh, challenging political uh, experience. I think it's a pity that so few academics, you know, become politicians <laughs> because I think it's an incredible uh, experience for for both for, for for the political life because you you bring some some something that is not so common to find, and is 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 very good for 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 an academic you know to have this kind of uh, insider you know view about the, the the how the the law is processed how the things so, but back to my the topic that we are going to discuss that is a very important one because uh, as you know you know the i would say that for decades the the, the alliance between us and europe uh, has been a kind of uh, pillar an anchor you know of stability for the changing world but today even though the partnership economically is even stronger than it was you know years ago in political terms you know is uh, is uh, is challenged and under many respect is becoming much more an ally uncertain you know and settled and this division i think is uh, very risky for both reason you know first because could undermine the the, the role of uh, US and Europe in the global economy and secondly because uh, could threaten the global security system if this anchor you know this kind of uh, a, a fundamental pillar is going to be weakened now the fundamental question to answer is why what's happened you know that at a certain point this uh, kind of partnership you know, encountered all these difficulties. And here we know the, the, the answer quite common is the break of President Trump and the current administration. I'm going to argue certainly, you know, the, the impact was uh, indeed very significant, but I will say it's not enough to justify this kind of uh, 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 weakening partnership. In other words, there are some more long-term structural factors that have been determining, you know, this uh, shift in the uh, transatlantic uh, relationship. And this is important because, uh, you know, a good diagnosis is very important to answer to the second question: what could, what can be done? What could be done in order to uh, in some way mitigate and even reverse this kind of worrisome trend. And I'm going to argue that in order to give a kind of answer, of course, you know, this is only a tentative kind of way of giving some, some answer, we have to look at what is today the current international economic and geopolitical order, or what is uh, even better defined, disorder. In other words, the, the, the kind of scenario for future transatlantic relations are very much correlated to the new and the future kind of international geopolitical and economic order. This is what I want to you know, present and discuss with you. And from this point of view, I'm going to offer some kind of insight about the options and the opportunities that are in these scenarios to reverse or revitalize the transatlantic partnership. But let me start you know, uh, very briefly, the long-term structural factors that are in some way you know, determining this kind of new uh, uh, shift in the transatlantic alliance. The first major you know, uh, 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 factor that behind uh, the international order 
is what's happened in the last dec two decades, a kind of you know, major redistribution of power at international level. What you are you know, looking in this graph is something that we, we know, but you know, sometimes we are undermining the, 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 the impact. What's happened was that the share of manufacturing and GDP of US and Europe have been significantly diminishing. And the share of you know, this third pool, that is China and Asia, have been rising astonishingly rapidly in, uh, in uh, economic and political terms. This is not, you know, this is a kind of historical change because, you know, we shifted from a kind of bipolar world economy, bipolar in terms of US and Europe, for two centuries. World economy was US and Europe, nothing else. This story, you know, has been changing in the last 30 years, and now we are into a tripolar world economy. And in fact, you know, if you look at the contribution to economic growth of the world economy over the past, you know, uh, 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 20, 15 years, this is very clear that the major contribution is coming from Asia is coming from Asia, is coming from the rest of Pacific Asia. The contribution of advanced country is diminishing you know, year after year. So we are in this new kind of world context from this point of view. And this is something that you know, is changing, not only the kind of macroeconomic uh, uh, framework, but it's changing how globalization has been working. Because, you know, this is, I don't know, probably you know very well, is a famous graph that has been presented by two World Bank economists, uh, 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 Milanovic and, and, and his colleague, showing the major redistribution of income at all level due to this kind of three-polar world economy. And you see here that you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the left part of the graph, there is this rising income per capita and in absolute terms in China and Asia. So you know, hundreds of millions of, the, of middle class has been uh, uh, creating you know, from the scratch in this new kind of uh, uh, new in the term economic terms. And on the second, on the on the on the uh, uh, right hand part of the graph, there is the you know very rapid decline of the middle class in developed world in the U.S. and Europe, who pay the highest cost of adaptation of this new tripolar world. The last part of the graph is showing who was the only you know gainers of this. That was very small segment of the society in US and Europe. Could be 10% in Europe, 1% in US, it doesn't, you know, certainly is a minority in terms. This is a major change because, you know, it did transform the globalization from Felix globalization to a globalization backlash. And the reason is this major redistribution of income. We had income growth, but it was a very exclusive growth. In other words, benefiting only a small part of the society and not at all you know, contaminating positively the majority part. So I think this is also very important to understand that what was the historical change that for two centuries, US and Europe has been producing you know, uh, industrial goods, and also benefiting from some rents, monopolistic rents. This is gone because technology has become more accessible, production processes have been fragmented, and now is, uh, you know, technology available to this kind of new uh, part of the world. So monopolistic rent is not anymore there, uh, we have no extra resources to distribute. This is another you know, major problem. So from this point of view, what I want to say, 
that you will live in, in a kind of world where the all order, international order, the rule and institution that for many decades have been benefiting US and Europe in terms of stability, economic growth, has not been able to offer anymore this public good of stability. And there is a very good you know, kind of uh, emblematic uh, 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 laboratory of this problem that was the story of the Doha Round. The Doha Round was the WTO, the last global WTO round. has been started in September, you know, after September 11, in, uh, in, uh, in November 2001, uh, 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 and was considered, you know, a kind of round in order to engage the new actors into the, the system. But this engagement did not work because we have been you know, experiencing that the shift from this uh, duopolistic world, US and EU, to a triple world was much more difficult to manage than we thought. So the governance that was so effective for many decades for the bipolar world has not been translated and you know, in some way has cannot be used to manage the new world. So the, the door around never ended. It's still open after you know, 17 years because there was no way of finding an agreement. So from this point of view, I think we could say that we're living in a transitional phase from an old order to, to where. We don't know yet because we are looking for you know, what could be a new structure of the international system. What we know is that this system is more and more like a, I like to de define an oligopolistic interdependence. You know what oligopoly is. You know, it's a market where you have few giant firms. All, each one of these firms has a veto power toward the rest, but there's no power of imposing unilaterally what they want to do. So oligopoly is a kind of system where if you want stability, equilibrium, you should find a compromise, a coordination among the giant firms. This is the world today. We are in an oligopolistic uh, interdependent world, but the problem is that it's very difficult to find this coordination and this cooperation. We have a lot of veto power that is expressed by one country to the other, but still we are looking for a kind of you know, uh, governance structure that could be very effective. So you see, the, 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 the future scenario for uh, governance could be any one of these three. We could go back into a multilateralism, rules and institution, but we should reinvent a multilateral kind of order. Or we can, uh, as we are today, in a neo-mercantilistic world, where every country trying to, you know, in some way to pursue his own goal, and sometimes at the expense of the other, or we could have what is called the oligopolistic balance of power. That was a very 19th century you know, kind of international system. What I want to, to, to highlight is that the transitional phase is a something where the old order doesn't work anymore, but you don't know yet what kind of you know, stable structure you are able to pursue. So it's a very you know, kind of uh, uh, trouble uh, uh, period, historical period. What we know is that the governance of this world is very important for economic growth at world level. Without a strong governance, we have, you know, it's very dif difficult to have stability and it's very difficult to have high economic growth. And in fact, in the last 10 years, economic growth at the world level was 25 percent lower than economic growth at the world level before the you know, uh, great crisis. 
Now, this is a story where I never mention President Trump. I never mention the uh, you know, uh, US administration because that was a story before you know, any kind of impact of the new administration. What's happened, of course, the arrival you know, of President Trump was indeed very significant because from this point of view, you know, the idea of President Trump was that the multilateral system, you know, we should not have a nostalgia of that system because that was a system that uh, has not benefiting at all the U.S. economy, the U.S. citizens. Even at worst, you know, our major partner have been free riders. They have been exploiting us, exploiting our open market and so on. From this point of view, you know, the, the consequences was a kind of open challenge to this system by, as you know, imposing this protectionist policy, a new tariff and so on. Now, it doesn't matter that there is no evidence whatsoever about this negative impact of the multilateral system. What, what does matter is that it was a political, strong political you know, kind of, uh, of strategy. And so from this point of view, it's very clear that the strategy of the, new, of the uh, current US administration were, is to restructure the trade finance relationship with what I think was an hub and spoke model with the US at the center. And of course, you know, from, from, from this point of view, it's very clear that what is worrisome is that the main goal of this strategy is very difficult to be achieved. The first goal is the story of, you know, trying to change this bilateral trade deficit. You see here, this is the US bilateral trade, you know, deficit with a quite a, a number of countries. China is the, uh, with the highest one, but you have Europe uh, 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 with Germany, Japan, Mexico, and Canada. Now, this is a goal, as you know, that is almost impossible to be achieved for one reason. There's no economic sense to have bilateral balance budget, uh, balance, uh, 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 trade uh, balance. So from this point of view, it's very difficult and has no you know, uh, uh, economic sense. And what is even uh, you know, more important is no uh, related to trade policy. It's related with macroeconomic policy. So you know, if you want to change your trade balance, you have to change your macro policy. President Trump you know, did a macro policy very expansionary, as you know. So the deficit, the trade deficit in the last year has been worsening, not, not, not improving. Although there was you know, this kind of new trade agreement with a number of countries. So this is the first problem, how you know, we, 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 we will be able to monitor this strategy. The second, as you know, very important goal is how to bring manufacturing job back to the US. That is an incredible, strong statement that has been made, you know, so several times. Now, this goal as well is very, very difficult to be achieved. You see here in this graph is showing, you know, over this from the 75 to, to today, the share of manufacturing employment over total employment in all advanced country. And you see here then an historical trend the share of manufacturing employment has been decreasing constantly everywhere. Of course, in the case of the US, this, you know, the starting point was a lower share, so this kind of decrease is even more uh, 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 intense. But it's decreasing for one reason, that manufacturing is increasing productivity, and so is, uh, you know, the employment share is decreasing, and the services is replacing you know, manufacturing as a major engine of economic growth. Not all services, producer services, the services for the firms. 
So from this point of view, how is possible to say that you are going to stop and even reverse this kind of trend? So it's very clear, you know, that that's, that's could be, you know, a, the, the, the two goals that are, you know, at the center of the uh, new strategy of uh, 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 current administration, the two goals are both at all, you know, not at all achievable. And in this kind of uh, changing world, we have this transatlantic rift. And the reason I think was that in this kind of bilateral world, the traditional alliance are seen as an hurdle rather than a resource. In other words, you know, the idea is that the alias are more the free riders than potential you know, kind of partner that could help you to achieve some kind of goal. And particularly European you know, alliance and integration has been openly challenged. And I don't, you know, I just put one uh, uh, definition of the current administration uh, European integration, but it's very clear that today AU is considered more a foe than a, a you know a, a traditional partner. And one during a, a trip to Europe during the G7 kind of meeting, President Trump said, you know, uh, that Europe was possibly as bad as China. You know, that was a, a very, uh, I would say, you know, quite unusual definition of what is Europe today. Now, Europe has responded so far to this kind of uh, 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 strategy, I will say, with a kind of measured reaction, trying to avoid any overreaction, because, you know, Europe has a kind of strong interest in maintaining multilateral trading system, and from this point of view, has been trying to accelerate free trade agreement with other countries during this last year and a half. We did you know, a, 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 a trade agreement with Japan. We did a trade agreement with Canada. We, we, we are now trying to accelerate some trade agreement also with, the, with, the, with the Singapore. So from this point of view, the reaction was uh, moderate and was also showing that we don't want to follow the US administration in this new path because we think it's very risky from this point of view. And on the other hand, you know, AU for many uh, reasons, but many times has been repeating that we are strongly involved with the US, you know, kind of partnership because, you know, for many reasons, but of course, you know, security is overwhelmingly the main reason why Europe cannot be on the other side of, the, of any kind of fight with the US. So if you want, you know, the situation is uh, this one. So if you ask what kind of option are that either the things could be could remain as they are, it could even you know been worsened, or any option that we, we could change, we could try to introduce you know some kind of modification that could you know improve and even relaunch. And very briefly to answer this question. I think we have to look at what is the war today. I already said the war today is a multipolar world, an oligopolistic world, not anymore bipolar, multipolar. Now, there is a, a major change. The rise to global economic you know, superpower status of China, this is no doubt for US, for Europe, is an, an international you know, is a kind of challenge that from many point of view, you know, is going to dominate the perspective of future, you know, uh, uh, foreign policy and economic policy of US and, 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 and Europe. From this point of view, 
I don't think that the main you know, uh, shift or the main change in the uh, uh, Trump administration has been to choose bil bilateralism. Bilateralism was already in the system before Trump. And AU is using bilateral deal. Japan is using bilateral deal. My you know, point is the major change in the strategy of President Trump is what is going on with China. Because, you know, for many years, we had this kind of strategic engagement, trying to involve China into our institution, our rules, WTO, IMF. And this is going to contaminate China to make China becoming more and more similar to our economy, market economy, to our system. Now, this engagement did not work very effectively. We should recognize it because you know, China did many transformation, but remained a very different kind of economy, a very different kind of political system. So what's happened this year, I think, the major shift was from strategic eng engagement to strategic competition. China is the main target today of what is, you know, from many point of view, not only an economic confrontation, but is becoming a political strategic confrontation. And from this point of view, you know, this strategic kind of uh, competition is creating two main risks at international level. And I mentioned this risk using two famous, you know, kind of example, one made by this, uh, you know, a uh, 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 little bit old kind of uh, authors that to see it as that was uh, writing about Sparta and Athens were, and was showing that when Sparta was the gemon, the predominant town, you know, a, a, a power in Greece, and Athens were rising as a new power, the problem was an unavoidable conflict among the two. And in fact, we had, you know, a major war. So Thucydides was saying there's no way of dealing with a rising new power challenging the incumbent than war. The second kind of trap is a completely different story because the first one is when you know, China is considered too strong. The second trap could come, Kinderberger, it was, as you know, a famous you know, uh, 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 American economist, international economist, it was writing that in the 30s, the reason why we had protectionist, we had depression, and at the end, you know, a kind of a complete failure of international system was not because there were superpower, but because there was a lack of leaders. No one was uh, leading the international system. So everybody, every country was a free rider, France, US, UK was not anymore the German. So the, the final result that there was no one able to provide the public good of stability of the system. So the new in this is the new order, we have these two risks. The to see the trap to arrive to a major conflict between the US and China, or the Kinderberger trap. In other words, no one is uh, is uh, no one major country is able to provide a stability. Now, what kind of scenario could we, you know, just, and this is my last point, I think the, the scenario could be two, as usually, you know, are too extreme. The first one is an unstable one. In other words, we could be very, you know, uh, uh, from this point of view, we consider that the U.S. relation with China is going to be transformed into a bilateral power struggle. So with intense increasing you know, conflict, and from this point of view, we could in some way envisage a kind of, you know, at least new decade or, or, or even more of a turbulent kind of international system. 
So from this point of view, you know, it's very clear that if nothing happened, in other words, if the, this kind of confrontation is going on and on, you know, this is going to produce and dominate, produce instability at international level. And the system is going to be, you know, not very friendly for economic growth. So this is a scenario, a possible scenario. If the US, you know, uh, 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 administration choose to go on and saying, you know, and thinking that there is no way of reconcile the goal of US with the goal of China, this could, could happen. And in this scenario, European you know, country and a transatlantic relation are going to be marginalized, are going to be, you know, from this point of view, not at all very important. Reluctantly, it could happen that the EU country are going to, you know, from this point of view to uh, align with the uh, US, but it's not going to change the main course of this, uh, of this, uh, of this kind of uh, antagonism. And from this point of view, it's not very difficult to you know, envisage what would happen because the trade war, for example, could become worse and worse. And here you have a, an estimation of the impact, the negative impact of a full-scale trade war or even a limited trade war for a number of countries. And you see that although there is not at all an homogeneous kind of impact, on average, the impact is going to be you know, extremely negative. The estimation is that the impact could be even worse than the great crisis in 2008, 2009. So from this point of view, it's very clear that this scenario is extreme scenario, unstable, G0, because G0 means that there is no G7, G20. It's just, you know, a, 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 a place with no leader. Now, this is the only scenario, not at all, unfortunately, because we could think that the, you know, two city trap and the Kinderberger trap could be, you know, managed from this point of view. We did manage in the past, for example, in a bipolar world. So from this point of view, I think we could think about a more stable scenario where the oligopolistic system at international level is able to reach a kind of compromise and a kind of cooperation, you know, attitude. This is the kind of game where you start with the players having conflicting goal, but the game is able to transform the goal of the player. They are very, you know, beautiful in game theory, showing that this is possible by cooperation and coordination. It's very clear that in this scenario, the main key, you know, uh, 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 effect is transforming the U.S.-China confrontation into a kind of, you know, uh, 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 confrontation that could be transformed in order to impose to China certain discipline in terms of the order. For example, at WTO level today, US, Europe, and Japan could, in some way, they already been doing, could impose China, something that you know, is very important, to not be free rider on certain things. Because we know very well you know, that it's unbearable that if you want to sell your good in China, you have to pay a sort of price in terms of, you know, transferring uh, uh, know-how, technology. This is unbearable for U.S. firms, is unbearable for European firms. So from this point of view, you know, to say that the confrontation should become more manageable, it doesn't mean that we are not recognized how serious it is today. But you know, in this more stable scenario, it's very clear that this confrontation is going to be transformed into a manageable kind of, uh, of uh, uh, bilateral relationship. And in this scenario, the role of Europe, the role of transatlantic country could be very important in contributing to transforming you know, what apparently is 
a kind of unavoidable conflict into a you know, political kind of manageable you know, confrontation. Why transatlantic relations could contribute? Because transatlantic relations today are indeed still very important. You know, I, I, I have no time, and if you want, we can go back. It's the most important economic partnership in the world today. Not so much in terms of trade. People, you know, used to look only on trade relation. But today, trade relation is only part of the story. What is more important is investment relation and service. And if you take all the three together, there is no comparison between the, in the role of, you know, uh, transatlantic relation and the relation between U.S. and Asia, U.S. and China, and a Europe and China. Just giving you a, a measure, the investment between U.S. and EU is 10 times higher, 10 times higher than investment of U.S. in China, Asia, or investment of Europe. No comparison of, you know, so transatlantic relations are indeed, you know, in economic terms, you know, very, very important and increasing their importance. The political side of the story is today, you know, what is uh, the trouble. And from this point of view, it's very clear that in this term, this new stable scenario could, could, could help. Certainly, you know, for a scenario you see here, for example, is interesting. This is China economic growth part, you know, in the in the 20, in the 30, and this is US 2% or 3%. You see that there is no way that China is not going to increase even in market terms. But if you add US and you know uh, European countries plus Canada and Australia, that is, you know, this yellow line, you see here that this coalition is still much more, you know, important than the China kind of size. So showing that potentially, you know, this is a kind of area that if he's able to maintain a certain coordination could, could play a very important role. Final of the story, this is a a scenario, this stable scenario that could be, you know, uh, 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 very much uh, uh, realized. But the, the condition is first U.S. and China on one side, the other Europe transformation. Because in order to be a very, you know, important player and an actor, AU should in some way upgrade its political role. AU is a from economic point of view, a very important actor still today, you know, yet yeah, today. But the problem is not an economic problem. For Europe, it's an apolitical problem. In other words, uh, uh, Europe is still an unfinished kind of process. We are in the midway of being, you know, a sum of major national economy to a more federation of economy. So from this point of view, this is another condition that should be fulfilled in order to have this more stable scenario. The reform and transformation of Europe more and more into a more integrated and politically you know, a, a consistent, a consistent area. And from this point of view, this is my last thing, certainly you know, we are going to have a very good test if this is possible or not, and it's going to be next year on May, the European election, when two major projects about the future of Europe are going to be confronted. On one hand, the nationalistic, sovereignistic kind of uh, you know, strategy and offer by some you know, kind of forces today in Europe, and on the other side, you know, the kind of more Europe, more integration is the kind of, uh, of, of, of a project. I think this is going to be, you know, a very important kind of test if is, Europe is in the right track or not. Thank you very much.